Hey guys, welcome back to another video analysis where we take a look at some pretty cool components, see how they work, talk about their functionality, and then we kind of go from there. In this one I have a really cool layout. This is actually from one of my old race bikes. I had an 06 Kawasaki ZX6R. And this is basically the drivetrain portion of it. This is the transmission gearbox assembly on here. And this particular gearbox, this is what's known as a dog box transmission. Now a dog box transmission is a type of sequential shift transmission. And what that means is, well right here we can see basically this model. I have 3D printed and we're going to kind of take a look and see how everything works whenever I start going through the gears. But basically in a, in a car setting, since some of you are probably familiar with that, if you have a sequential shift transmission, basically anytime you bump the shifter uh, in the forward direction, you would downshift, or if you pull back, you would upshift a gear. So for example, I have my little makeshift shifter right here, and basically you rev the engine up, go from first to second, second to third, third to fourth, but then when you downshift from fourth to third, every time you bump the shifter in the forward direction, you're dropping a gear, unlike your traditional first, second, third, fourth, fifth, that type of transmission layout for the for vehicles that actually still have a manual transmission. Uh, and the reason why sequential shift transmissions are great is because you can shift a lot quicker and it's a lot more efficient. With the motorcycle, it is a sequential shift type of transmission, but what's different about it compared to your more traditional manual transmission is the way it actually shifts internally, the way the gears actually come together on this. Now, I apologize, the lighting's pretty shite, but I'm probably gonna have to shoot this from a couple different angles so you can kind of look at how the shifting actually works on here. So instead of actually shifting it again with your hand, with the motorcycle, again, a lot of you are probably familiar with this already, you use your left uh, foot, I almost said left hand, you, know, you use your left foot to actually shift. Well, actually, I guess that depends if you're on a smaller bike, but eh, again, different story, different story. So you use your left foot to actually shift, but again, it's still that same idea to where you either bump down to downshift or bump up to upshift, and we're not going to talk about standard versus GP shift. It's still the same idea. Basically, it would go upshift, 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 downshift, downshift, downshift on there. And again, the pattern that I just did, that's what's known as GP shift to where you're flipping it. And again, there's different advantages for that in a race environment, but for most bikes on the road, basically starting from first gear, it would go first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and if you have six gear, six. And then to downshift from six to fifth, you would bump it down every time. Again, that's the sequential aspect of that. But why they call it a dog box transmission, so, you know, this isn't the most original video, there's, there's plenty of videos out there for that. This is just to kind of give you an idea and kind of show you how all the uh, mechanisms work together with this 3D printed model I made. So right here, what's responsible for the actual shifting, there's a couple things. You actually have the shift arm itself, again this is operated with your foot. Then you have a little rod that passes through the inside of the transmission housing, and this would be the actual selector mechanism itself. And again, I'm going to show different angles of this because it's really hard to kind of see everything. Well, basically, anytime I move this, I'm not doing a full shift right now, but you can see that every time I press down on the shift lever right here, the shift arm mechanism is going to actually move. You have a little star wheel mechanism right there. And basically, this little selector mechanism is going to cause this shift drum to rotate on there. And every time, don't worry, I'm going to show you all this working. Every time that shift drum rotates, you can see in this particular transmission, we have three little grooved sections right there. And once this transmission, once I actually like start shifting on here and show you how this works, you'll see that these selector forks will basically follow the grooves and they will select the different gears. This is basically the input side. This is where your engine is going to have a gear that's going to be a mesh with this clutch basket gear right here. And any time, by the way, this setup's upside down, so this would be facing towards the bottom, but again, the reason why I made this is so you can kind of see everything a lot easier. So basically what's going to happen is your engine is going to be spinning in this direction clockwise, and because it's splined with another type of spur cut gear on this clutch basket, it's going to cause this to rotate. But if you notice, when I'm rotating this, I'm holding right here, and again, I'll you know what, let me just do it now so we can see it. So our engine is basically going to be spinning this clutch basket in this direction. But if you notice, this hub right here, only when this rotates is when we actually get a rotation of these gears right here. 
So if I hold this stationary and rotate this clutch basket right here, you can see there's no power transfer occurring. And that's because we need clutches inside of here to actually transmit power between the engine and the input side of the transmission on there. And clutches, just in a nutshell, you'll have steel plates which only rotate with the basket. So let me see if I have something around here. So basically, you're gonna have a steel that only rotates with the clutch basket right here on the outside. And then you're gonna have a friction material. I know this is a steel feeler gauge, but you're gonna have a friction type of material. You think of it sort of like a paperish material. It's a bad analogy, but whatever. That's only gonna spin with this internal hub, like so. And whenever you have the clutch lever pressed or pulled in, or if you have a vehicle, a motor vehicle, an automobile, anytime you have the clutch pedal depressed, basically what's gonna happen is the steel and the frictions are just gonna slide between one another. They're not actually gonna transmit power. But the moment that you release the, the clutch lever on a bike or you let off the clutch on, a, on an automobile, on a car, basically you're gonna have something that's going to wedge those two components together and it's going to lock the basket and the hub together. And only then is when power transfer is gonna occur. Now on a bike, you're gonna have a pressure plate that's on this side, and what I'm gonna do is sort of mimic the action. Uh, this is going to be the actual clutch lever itself on the bike. When the clutch lever is released, versus whenever I start pressing it in, you're gonna have the pressure plate start to back off, and what happens is the, material, the friction in the steel will start sort of slipping as a result. And you can think of it like this, again, so, Clutch lever released, power transfer is occurring between the engine and the actual transmission. Clutch lever engaged. The engine's still rotating, but now because of the fact that the pressure plate has kind of released uh, its clamping force against the actual frictions and steels, it's gonna have a sort of slipping action. And again, I wish I would've had some frictions and steels around here to kind of show you, but hopefully you kind of get the idea. And there's, again, there's plenty of videos out there that kind of describes that point. But basically, just know that if we want to transmit power from the engine to the actual input shaft of the transmission, you need a clutch pack to lock those components together. And again, frictions are splined to the hub, steels are gonna be splined to the actual clutch basket itself. And then you just have a pressure plate in this case that sandwiches and squeezes them together and transmits power. So, knowing that, now I'm gonna flip this around. And what I'm gonna be doing for this one is I'm just simulating, we're just gonna say that the clutches are engaged and the power from the engine is being sent to the transmission on here. Now right now, this transmission should be in neutral. And you can see how all these gears within here are rotating with the input shaft. However, if you notice on here, this is gonna be the output shaft right here, or basically the sprocket coming off the output shaft. And I'll rotate this around so you can kind of see everything uh, a little bit later. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold on to the output shaft right here, and you can see that there's no power transfer occurring on this one. But we can clearly see that there are a lot of gears spinning in here. Now I want you to pay attention to a couple things. And once again, I'm gonna zoom in. So we're gonna go back in frame, take a look at the actual selector gear mechanisms itself. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm holding that sprocket stationary on the output and I'm spinning the engine. Notice something interesting happening? Again, right now we're looking at the input shaft right here and currently I'm holding the output shaft which is, I'm gonna use my pointer, the output shaft is in the background right here. And I'm holding that stationary and you can see how when I rotate the input shaft of the transmission, Certain gears rotate, other gears don't. These gears in particular, here, 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 and here, those are splined with the input shaft of the transmission, meaning that if the input shaft rotates, those are forced to rotate. They have to, no matter what. These gears here and here sort of float on bearings on here. They're sort of, they're separately, so even though they are technically part of the input shaft, they have bearings to support them. They're not physically splined to the input shaft, which is why they sort of freewheel. And the same idea with the output shaft in the background. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to flip this around. Whenever I spin 
the input shaft and hold the output shaft stationary, you can see that certain gears, these ones in particular, are rotating, while these, the actual gear selector mechanisms itself, don't rotate. But look at what happens when I stop the engine input and I start rotating the sprocket. It's the same idea. So whenever I rotate the sprocket right here, you can see that this gear and that gear are forced to rotate, which means that those are going to be splined to the output shaft, meaning that if the output shaft spins, those are forced to rotate as well. While these four gears here, 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 and here, even though they are technically part of the output shaft, they're on bearings. They're not physically splined to it, meaning that they don't necessarily have to spin with the output shaft. And that's very, very important because you'll see this setup on regular manual transmissions for synchro mesh transmissions. And on those, you get different gear ratios. And the reason why the transmission doesn't just grenade is because of the fact that certain gears are only selected at a time, even though they're all sort of meshed together. And that's because certain ones spin with a certain shaft while other ones sort of are held stationary or loosely by bearings. So another thing I want to point out on this is sort of what I was talking about earlier. The reason why they call this a dog box transmission. And it's a lot easier right now. We have fifth and sixth gear on this transmission and see how we have sort of like these teeth that are sticking out. These are the actual engagement dogs on here. It's the same idea with the output shaft gears in the back, but with this, um, it's a lot easier to actually see what's going on. Whenever you actually shift, you'll see this selector fork move over in relation to the drum up here that's sort of out of frame. And that's actually going to lock, if we remember, again, I'm gonna hold the sprocket stationary. We're, we're looking back at the input shaft right now. Whenever I spin the input side and the input shaft is rotating, these gears have to rotate with the input shaft because they're physically splined to it. But if we want power transfer to actually occur, you're gonna see that these are basically gonna move over and lock certain gears together. And that's gonna give us different gear ratios, which is going to give us different output speed, output torque on the output shaft, which is a sprocket, which ultimately goes to your drive wheels. It's the same idea behind an actual vehicle or car, depending on what you drive with the manual transmission. It's the same idea, it's just the, the way it actually, the way things interlock together in here is gonna be a little bit different compared to that, but we're not worried about those just yet. So on this, the actual engagement dogs, if you notice, they have sort of an angled cut on them, and that's very, very important because if you want something to, well, you know what, let me actually just go ahead and shift so you guys can see this real quick. So I'm gonna bring this up to, fourth and fifth gear, you hear a lot of clinking right now, nothing's happening, and that's because stuff in the background's moving. Okay, so right now we are in fifth gear, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slowly rotate this, and I'm going to shift into sixth gear. You know what? Let me back this up just a tiny bit. I told you this is not gonna be the easiest thing to film. So, let me go back down to fourth gear, and then back to, or sorry, not fourth gear, fifth gear. And let me go back up to sixth gear so we can actually see this thing shifting. Now you can see that whenever the input shaft rotates, the teeth are actually going to lock together and transmit power from this gear to that one to the output shaft and then cause the drive wheel to rotate in this one. Now the reason why they angle those cuts is referred to as undercutting or back cutting the gears is so it's, it's a lot harder for the gears to actually pop out when they're angled like that because basically they get wedged tighter and tighter if they try to pull apart so it helps lock them together. And what people will do, even on cars and other vehicles, for performance transmissions, they'll actually get a steeper angle on this to help them lock even tighter together and that's very, very important to prevent them from slipping out of gear when you're pushing a lot of power, a lot of torque through these transmissions. Again, it's not just motorcycles that have these. For performance shifting applications, they will use a dog box transmission on vehicles just because you can get faster, faster shifts on there. But unfortunately, you probably saw a problem whenever I was shifting earlier. Let me actually go back to fifth gear. Well, what happens if you shift? I'm gonna try now to shift from fifth to sixth gear. And look at what happens if I'm not lined up. 
you can see we haven't shifted into gear. It's only whenever I hold this sprocket on the output that they finally lock into place. So timing your shifts is very, very critical to make sure you have a nice smooth shift. It, can, it is possible to get this done very, very quickly, but there's no synchronizer mechanism like on a manual transmission to help aid in your shifting on here. And another thing about these transmissions is these are straight cut or spur cut gears, which means there's no thrust forces being generated like on a typical synchro mesh style transmission. Now those transmissions, the synchro mesh, like you see on a lot of automobiles that have manual transmissions, they're very, very quiet. They're very, very strong gears, but unfortunately they have a tendency to generate a lot of thrust force. So for anything performance related, you will see people go to a straight cut or spur cut gear transmission, not because they're stronger, but because the cases on the housing would have to be so incredibly thick to withstand those thrust forces generated on that. It basically would blow the transmission apart on there. Unfortunately, the downside with this, apart from them not being as strong as the synchro mesh gears, is they're going to be noisy. But again, for most racing applications, you don't really care about the noise on there. And it gives an unmistakable whine noise for these types of transmissions. And what I mean by that is for anybody that has ever driven a manual transmission in an automobile of some sort, in reverse, they have a spur or straight cut gear. And whenever you go in reverse, you'll hear that noise on there. And that is from the actual gears on here. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your transmission. That just means that's how, well, it's, it's functioning normally on there. And that's just the result of this type of gear. So now we're going to take a look at the actual shift selector mechanism right here and how it interacts with the actual shift drum. And remember, the drum, as it rotates, is going to move the shift selector forks, and that in turn is going to move the gears, which are going to lock to the different, or give us different gear ratios as we go from first, second, third, fourth, etc. throughout the transmission. So on here, right now we're in first gear, and what I'm going to do is we're just going to look and see how everything kind of interacts. And see how you heard sort of like that double notch? Actually on motorcycles, you have first, neutral, and then second gear. And you have a little detent mechanism inside of the transmission that makes it easier to find neutral. I've actually taken it out of here, but just to make shifting a lot easier. But that's why you have to be firm with your shift, because otherwise if you're just a little bit gentle on there, you'll actually shift into neutral and then you're not transmitting power on there. So you have to be, and you'll notice on here, it's kind of hard to see, but the actual notch on this little star mechanism right here, it's a very, very small detent on here. So as long as you're firm and you're shifting, you'll easily bypass that in the shift into second gear, no problem. This little detent arm, it has a spring and a little roller bearing that fits conveniently into one of the little star notches. And that's what makes sure that you actually stay in gear along with the actual uh, engagement dog mechanisms, the undercut on them or the back cut. But yeah, right now we are in second gear, third gear fourth, fifth, and sixth. In reality, on the actual motorcycle itself, it's gonna, the shifting is going to be a lot smoother because you're rev matching and, um, and you're gonna actually going to have a solid material, not PLA plastic on here. And you can see it's kind of flexing when I shift, but it still gets the job done in terms of showing you how this works. So now we're going from sixth to fifth to fourth, to third, to second, all the way back to ideally, oh no, see what I mean? There we go, first gear. See, smooth sailing, easy. So this mechanism basically, at least for Kawasaki, it should be pretty similar between the other bikes, it has a little spring on here. And if you look very, very closely when I go into second gear, it basically, it has sort of like a, you can think of it like a ratchet, a ratcheting tool on there. In one direction it locks and engages it, but then whenever it goes back the other direction, see how this is starting to kind of push out? It basically slips over the protruding teeth on this little star mechanism, slips over it, and then right about there, it latches to the next one. So you can see, that's the, the ratchet mechanism, at least when you're upshifting for this one. So when you shift from first to second, and then whenever you go from second to third, it's actually grabbing the little tabs that are sticking out on the star mechanism right here. So again, still engaging, still engaging, shifts into gear, and then whenever you release pressure from that, 
You have a spring on the other side that basically is forcing this to go back to its original position. And again, the tapered part of this caused it to sort of slide over it and engage with the next one. So again, engage, slips, engage, slips, etc. And that's the same idea for whenever you're downshifting. It's just that now it's like you flipping the little palm mechanism on your ratchet in the other direction. So for this one, it's locking and engaged in this direction, but it slips there, engages, slips, engages, slips, etc., etc. Really, really simple mechanism, and it's pretty common on a lot of transmissions on there. And just to get a better frame of that spring that I was talking about, right here. Now I have a bolt running through here, but in reality they have a little pin on the inside of the clutch cover. Whenever you take it out, there's a pin that protrudes through here. And you can see that anytime I move this little shift arm right here, you see how that spring kind of flexes in one direction and then it flexes in the other direction. Basically, that's gonna be your return to zero point on there. So now, I think we can finally look at everything operating. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom out and you should have noticed by this point that there's a little paint mark on this sprocket. Now what I'm gonna to try to do is keep my speed relatively consistent on the input side as I go through the gears and then you guys should be able to see what happens with the paint mark in terms of output speed on here every time I shift gears. And what I'm gonna do is we'll look at one view of this, I'll go through the gears, I'll say them out loud, I'll upshift, downshift, and then what I'm gonna do is I'll flip it around, that way you can see the other side uh, shifting as well, the actual interaction between the drum, the shift forks, the actual gear selector mechanisms themselves. And then also look at the paint mark on here to kind of keep track of how fast the output is rotating with every gear change. Now remember, the lower the gear for a second, third, you're gonna have a higher torque output, but it's gonna be a slower rotational speed. But then the faster your vehicle actually travels, torque isn't as important. That's where power starts coming in and you're gonna see the output speed start increasing on here. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and start rotating this. Now keep in mind, right now we are in first gear. So I'm gonna to try to keep my input speed relatively consistent as I go through the gears. And occasionally you may see my finger kind of come over here and kind of hold the sprocket. That's just to kind of help assist with the actual shifting on here. So let's see how everything works. First gear, second gear, third gear, Fourth gear. Fifth gear. And sixth gear. See how much faster that output's spinning compared to the input? Now we're gonna go ahead and start downshifting. So from sixth to fifth. Fifth to fourth. Fourth to third. Third to second. And second to first gear. And then neutral. You can see that I'm holding the output. So now I'll flip this around. All right, same idea. Let's go ahead and go into first gear from neutral. And again, there is our paint mark coming around right about there. So again, I'm gonna to try to keep my input shaft speed consistent. Remember, this is gonna be the power coming from the engine to the basket, clutch is engaged, sending power to the hub, to the input shaft, output shaft, ultimately to the drive sprocket, which goes to our drive wheel. So again, spinning. Now we're gonna go from first to second. Second to third. Third to fourth. Fourth to fifth. Now those are the engagement dogs on the back we can't see. And fifth to sixth. 
Now we're gonna go ahead and start downshifting from sixth to fifth. Fifth to fourth. Fourth to third. Third to second. And finally, back into first gear. And then, hop into neutral. This is really hard to frame from the top, but hopefully you'll get an idea. So once again, I'll go through the gears, say them out loud so we can kind of keep track of what's going on. So first gear. That was neutral. Second. Third. Fourth. Fifth. Sixth. Fifth, fourth, third, second, first. There is one more thing I want to show you guys though. Now there's a reason why we're zoomed in to the basket and clutch hub assembly right here. And remember, the basket, the engine's going to be driving that through this ring gear. And you're going to have steels that are locked with the basket. They're going to spin only with the basket. Then you're going to have frictions, which are going to be splined to the clutch hub assembly. And then you're going to have a pressure plate on the outside that locks them together whenever the clutch handle is released. But then whenever you pull the clutch in, disengages power, applies power, disengages, applies it like that. So with an engine, it has a very limited range for where it's going to be making peak power, peak torque. We're going to say like from here to here on a typical four stroke internal combustion engine. With a two stroke, that band goes from this to like right there, pretty much. It's a very narrow band to where it's going to be making peak power, peak torque. And honestly, with a two stroke, it's not really going to be making much torque on there. But whenever the power kicks in, you will know it. You'll, you'll be surprised by some smaller CC engines. But regardless of that, we know that whenever, so basically the point of the transmission assembly over here, what we looked at, is to keep the engine ideally within its optimum range where it's making most power, most torque. And we already know that whenever you give it the beans, you get on the throttle, engine revs up, and then when it falls outside that range to where it starts becoming inefficient, we want to upshift to the next gear. And then we hear that, or see that, if you actually have a tachometer, the RPMs drop. And that's because you're selecting the different gear mechanisms in here to keep it within that proper power band on there, right? Now, for regular automotive vehicles, uh, manufacturers are more concerned about fuel economy, but it's the same idea. They want to keep it in that proper band to where it's making the, the best fuel economy. Unless you start looking at the performance sector, then yeah, it's the same idea as what we're talking about here. But with this one, the manufacturer, so let's just say again, we're shifting from third to fourth gear. Engine revs up to 14,000 RPM. Then we start kind of the horsepower begins dropping off. So then we decide to upshift in from third to fourth gear. I think I said third first, but either way, third to fourth gear, RPM drops. And then we're coming up to, again, our, we're getting close to red line. We'll say it's like 15 or 16,000 on the spike. We decide to upshift before then, but uh oh, we mess up and we downshift. And the result of that is, well, uh, two things are going to happen. The engine, is gonna to want to over rev and go beyond the rev limiter on there and basically have a situation to where the valves will float, the piston will ram into it, and your basically your engine's going to self-destruct very, very quickly because it isn't designed to go above that red line. Even though you have a rev limiter, well, unfortunately now the drive wheel is now basically going to drive the engine. However, manufacturers have some pretty cool, oh, there goes the cat machine. <laughs> So I want you all to pay attention. It may be hard to see on the video, but look at the either the outer part of this clutch hub or where it sort of meets the inside of this plate right here. So normally, the engine, I'm gonna say, goes clockwise to drive the wheels. But then if you're in a situation where you downshift and you don't feather the clutch properly, or if you downshift and you're already in too high of an RPM, and what's gonna happen is basically the drive wheel is going to attempt to drive the engine. And whenever that happens, I'll try to keep my fingers out the way so you can hopefully see what's happening. Do you see the movement, how the clutch hub is actually starting to move out like this? So whenever that clutch hub moves out, it's actually going to put, it's going to be forcing the pressure plate 
to move in this direction. Remember, the pressure plate is actually what squeezes the frictions and steels together. And a better analogy I should have thought of for frictions and steels, literally think of it like your, your brake pads and rotors on your vehicle or even on your motorcycle. Just think that there's basically a bunch of tiny rotors and a bunch of tiny pads that you can use to lock them together. Or if you release the pedal, you can separate them. So that's kind of the idea here. That plate locks them together normally, but if the drive wheel attempts to drive the engine, you can see how that clutch hub is moving in this direction. So whenever it does that, it forces the pressure plate to take off pressure from the actual frictions and steels and it's going to allow it to slip as a result and the point of that is to make sure that the wheel doesn't to basically keep the wheel more stable under deceleration so the back end doesn't swing around so much you have less engine braking you have less tendency to over rev the engine and even though the factory ones aren't too great there's a lot of aftermarket options out there to where basically you can get rid of engine braking entirely on there uh if you want a more if and it just depends on the rider. Me personally, I use engine braking to slow down the bike as in tandem with it. And you have to kind of rev match with that. There's people that modify the springs. There's all sorts of tricks you can do for that. But basically, that's what happens if your drive wheel starts attempting to drive the engine. When you downshift and you don't have good clutch control. Or if you accidentally do a money shift and hopefully you won't destroy your engine. But I hope that makes sense, guys. As usual, the video ran on longer than anticipated. But I hope you enjoyed it and hope you got to get a better understanding of what's going on with this.